courtesy of NTT Home Plate Cam. Dan Carlos and I are joined by Howie Rose, the longtime radio voice of the New York Mets on WCBS Radio New York. Howie, we appreciate the visit here. Nobody is more qualified to talk Mets history than you. So let's start with the Seaver deal. Is it true that, that part of the motivation for this deal was a sports writer's vendetta that finally shipped him out of town? It might have been the catalytic force in getting that done, Matty, because it was complicated. You know, this was at the very, very beginning of the free agency era. 1977 was the first year that players were playing under newly signed free agent contracts, Reggie Jackson, I guess, being the most prominent of those. And Tom still had a couple of years left on his deal and was hoping to um, renegotiate it, which was a dirty word to the columnist Dick Young. Now, M. Donald Grant, who was the stuffed shirt, who was the board chairman for the New York Mets back in those days, uh, and Young were in cahoots about a number of different things, not the least of which was that Young's son-in-law was working in the front office of the Mets. And so there definitely was some collaboration there in Young's columns, which painted Seaver as an ingrate, among other things. And so with that as not just the backdrop, but the impetus, it led to Seaver being moved. Howie, would you would you say that Met fans at that time were outraged over the trade of Tom Seaver? I'll put it this way, Dan. This is long before the Internet we're talking about now. Long before there were message boards or certainly Twitter or any other ways for fans to vent other than by whether or not they came to the ball games. And that's exactly what happened. In, in so many words, the fans, as this began to develop, and it wasn't a brand new thing either because, you know, Siva was considered, I don't know, militant's maybe too strong a word, but remember there was a, a minor job action in 1976. And at that time, it was rumored that the Mets and the Dodgers had been discussing a one-for-one -one Tom Seaver for Don Sutton trade, which obviously did not happen. But really beginning then, fans made it known the best way that they could that if you trade Tom Seaver, we're not coming. Now, I suppose it was the perfect or maybe imperfect storm because when Seaver was traded on this date in 1977, the Mets were clearly a team in decline and the attendance absolutely plummeted. And really, the Mets did not recover from that for seven years. All right, Howie. So how... Now that you said the Mets really couldn't recover and it took that that long, how did the Mets eventually recover? How did the fans come back and start loving the Mets again after um, departing, after Tom Sevier uh, departed? Well, Carlos, a couple of things happened, not the least of which was the team was sold in January of 1980 because the original owner of the Mets, a wonderful woman named Joan Payson, uh, had passed away uh, right after the 1975 season. And although her family tried to run it, their hearts and frankly, their money really wasn't in it. And so after plummeting to, you almost can't believe that this happened in New York, but a paid attendance for the 1979 season of 788,000 at Chase Stadium. That's when the team was put up for sale and it was bought by a, a combination of Nelson Doubleday and Doubleday and Company, Fred Wilpon and Sterling Equities and, and, and some other minor investors. But that partnership completely revitalized the Mets early in the 1980s. And when things really turned the corner, it had been 1984 and Davey Johnson was the new manager. Dwight Gooden was in his rookie of the year season. And they had a first baseman who was acquired, not coincidentally, on this date, the year before 1983, who was the catalyst in turning it all around. Yeah, let's talk about that one too, Howie, because uh, just a year after the deal, Keith Hernandez finished as second in MVP consideration in the National League. It's not like he was a star in decline at the time of the trade. Why then did the Cardinals accept such a compensation package? And looking back at it, I know hindsight being 2020. That just doesn't seem like anything that any fantasy league owner would have accepted, let alone a major league general manager. You know, Matt, there's actually a funny little corollary to that. I don't know if this is true because I certainly wasn't in the room at the time these things were being discussed. I've been told by more than one person who was aware of the negotiations at the time that Frank Cashin, the Mets general manager, when um, Whitey Herzog had called and said, if you'll talk about Neil Allen, we'll talk about Keith Hernandez. Um, 
you know, Frank not only practically dropped the phone, but as those negotiations ensued, he actually tried to hold Whitey Herzog up for even more uh, than just Keith Hernandez. Maybe it was just trying to subtract, say, Rick Ownby from that deal, which wouldn't have made a, a hill of beans worth a difference anyway. But I, I think, you know, history will reflect. And look, full disclosure here, Keith is a friend of mine, and, and he'll admit right now that, you know, things between him and Whitey Herzog were not good back then. But uh, remember, Keith had been involved in what turned out to be those drug trials, which culminated in Pittsburgh in, in what was it, 1985. And it, it was known within the Cardinals organization that for a period of time, Keith had been indulging. And that was a major problem. And, and I don't know to what extent Whitey might have read him the riot act along the way, but it became clear that they were not going to coexist much longer. And, and that's what led up to his being traded. Boy, we could go on and on with some of these great stories with you, Howie. Such great information. Uh, we appreciate the time. We didn't even have a chance sure. to get to the current Mets, but maybe we do that on another occasion. Thanks for celebrating uh, June 15th and May history with us. You got it, guys. Thank you for having me.